talk about Mount Sinai and the nature of that re of the revelation that took place there, specifically its um, level of perspicacity. <laughs> I like that word. We have with us two distinguished rabbis, Rabbi Benjamin Hecht, who is the founding director of Nishmadat, well, Nishma.org is the <laughs> name of the website, which you should check out, and the organization is Nishma, and Rabbi Eliezer Breidowitz, who is the Rosh Yeshiva of Darche Torah in Toronto. So, Rabbi Hecht, you have a thesis that you're going to present to us about I, the... I, I want to present the following idea, and uh, um, to the following extent, in the sense that many people, when they argue that the revelation, the presentation, presentation of revelation, is they almost argue that things are unclear, and um, you need clarity to, um, to you know, of clear moral judgment and so forth. So, so it's ne necessary for God to make a clear statement of morality. And and without quoting certain names, but there's one one uh, um, once one great guttle of the of the uh, 20th century who wrote a whole essay on the fact that. Um, based on some ideas of Sajigon, and basically that uh, from natural morality we would be, we'd, we'd be unclear about certain aspects of, of, of moral decision making. Um, for example, give an example? Yeah, yeah, for so. example, he says that murder yeah. is um, clearly prohibited. But the exact point of the dividing line of murder is problematic. In other words, is abortion murder? Is it not murder? In other words, we need going God to, to clarify. Murder. We have to need yeah. God to clarify and to state, here's the answer. And he argues that this is the very purpose of, of, of revelation in this moral context to, cl to give precision when natural morality would not be precise. My difficulty with his answer, and specifically in terms of abortion, is that if you ever analyze the halachic um, spectrum opinion, the opinion of Jewish law in terms of abortion, while it's true that that spectrum is narrower than would be found in the secular world, there is a tremendous amount of debate on a variety of issues um, on both sides in terms, of, in terms of the issue. So the fact is, is, is that because of that, and through the, 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 the concept of, of what we've seen, is, is that the reality of disagreements within Jewish law that uh, permeates the Gemara, and uh, as Ramosha Feinstein says, is, is that it's a reality that it's full of disagreements, and that's the reality of Jewish law. It, it, the, the whole concept of Torah is full of, for us of what we call machlokas of disagreements. It seems to me that really what is presented at, at Har Sinai is what I have termed is really a cloudy revelation in the sense that it's not give, God giving us the specific answers to, to questions. Um, he's not telling us clearly right and wrong. He has something else. That, that, he is, that he is doing in that presentation. And I assume th th is th this is not a, a mishap on God's part, no, right? No, and it's no not, obviously and it's not, not. No, but it's also not uh, a limitation, say, like that, that somehow language limits his ability to express no. himself clearly, but that he actually intends for the cloudiness to be there. I think so. Okay. And, and I think that that's... that's, that's well, I'll tell you, I think the conception is a little cloudy. I could <laughs> agree with you, <laughs> yeah. but I would put it differently. Okay. In other words, what God said is clear. But God did not give us a list of first principles. Okay. Because God gave okay. us um, a number of cases. And he said, in this case, this is the law. Mm -hmm. In this case, this is the law. In this case, this is the law. Everything God said is crystal clear. In that very specific case, this is the law. The question is, we now have to look for the underlying patterns in order to apply the law to similar cases, or maybe very different cases, that is where the cloudiness lies. In other words, it's not a flaw in revelation, it's just that the substance of revelation is really not uh, yeah, a set of axioms. I, yeah, I, I, think, I think that that, that, uh, that I give any implication of flaw in revelation, this is, I think, is, is God's intent. But I, I think when I'm, when I'm presenting that, what, I, what I'm saying is, is that he has given us a few very straightforward statements, um, which are very clear. But the point is, is that trying to create a complete system from these statements yields a cloudiness. And, and therefore, 
even in terms of even analyzing these statements, and we see the the whole the whole perception, especially with the, with, with with the with certain concepts within Torah Shabbal Pan and, and and the methodology that was given with with the method of analyzing the written law. In fact, in certain ways, Torah Shabbal Pan is even the oral more, law, the moral law the, the, is the oral, the oral law is even yeah. more significant. In certain ways, what we are presented with is something that, yes, God is presenting that statements, but in a certain way. How we deal with those statements, we're, we're, we're not exactly sure. And therefore, as they say in the case of the abortion case, yeah, we sort of know at the two ends that this is for sure usher, prohibited, and this is for sure um, permitted. In fact, all, perhaps in certain cases where abortion is obligated. But if God's intent was to clarify the moral dilemma, um, we don't really have that, that type of, of, of real clarity. Yes, there's a little bit of clarity, but we don't have that clarity. So therefore, what it arises in me is, what then is the, is, is the purpose of revelation in his involvement? In terms of, I, I think that, as I said, this, this, the, the presentation of Godel was that the purpose of revelation was to clarify. My question is, but it doesn't seem to clarify that well. So then we have to investigate a, a certain different idea in terms of uh, revelation. Why did God not present the axioms? But the question is, it's true that the Talmud is full of debate, right. but does the debate center around the great moral issues or does it really center around the very, very odd case, the exceptional case, the uh, rare combination of circumstances in which we don't know which moral principle to apply? I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I, I have, I've, in many cases, the argument is, is on things that are not so simple, or, or things that are much more detailed. But you think of the argument, let's say, between, example, I think, between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Gamliel vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, capital punishment. And Rabbi Akiva saying, I would never execute anyone. I would always find a loophole. And uh, Rabbi Gamil saying, I think it's Rabbi Gamil, right? It's, right? Um, saying, you can't do that. Capital punishment is 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 still necessary, while while the, while still within the Jewish atmosphere, Jewish attitude. You're right. There's a concept of limiting capital punishment. I think that has a that has certain aspects of, of great moral debate, and we have. Well, actually, but, but again, I'm sorry. I, I think the issue uh, there is a we, question. Uh, I'm of sorry to interrupt, Brad. We do. We have to take a short break, <laughs> and we will be back. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> We're ta we are talking about, uh, we're, what was the last case we were talking about? Rabbi Kiva versus Rabbi Gamliel, right, on the issue of capital punishment. Right. right. You the, to, again, uh, the debate there is not about the morality of capital punishment. Because we all understand that the right. Torah itself says there are right. certain crimes for which a person forfeits his life. Right. The question is, what safeguards in the judicial process do we want to institute to ensure that no injustice is done? It's a, it's a question of, it's the same idea, is, is Rabbi Kiva basically arguing that capital punishment should be treated the same way as the concept of ben sora or mora? That the, the Torah, the, the way we're saying, the Torah the says saying, it, yeah. but that doesn't mean you should actually ever have a case of that. Yeah, but and, again, you know, e even the case of the rebellious son of which you speak is an yeah. example. In other words, it's true that it may have no practical application because the conditions that are necessary could never okay. be met. Okay. But the moral principles that are derived from that topic okay. are valid. Okay, so, so, okay. Are there basic moral principles that you would say are, are, are found in it? In many ways, I find the Torah has many basic moral principles, sometimes almost contradictory moral principles in the sense, that, and by the way, that's the way morality really works. And morality is actually a world of prioritization. It's, it's not really, I don't think it's like... To give us an, an example of I don't that, think it's good a... versus evil. I think it's an aspect where, where um, um, this has value, but it's overridden by another value in this, in this uh, circumstance. I think that's the real way to structure uh, well, so you're a saying, morality. You're saying the lack of clarity isn't in any given commandment. It's in the conflict between them then. 
Um, or at least maybe maybe you have something else in mind as well. But right no, now you're I saying th I think that's that, where the clarity, okay. the lack so, of clarity emerges. So what I think what involves it is 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 that the, re the the moral system, people like to have a black and white moral system, and they like to have a black and white moral system that is defendable or defensible by saying God told me, right? That 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 uh, that uh, I do this why? Because God told me, and I don't have to be a decision maker. And what I see is, is that's the way people like to turn to revelation. Like, it's not my decision, God told me, I'm just listening to God, which itself is a decision, but you know. But what you see in Torah is, is that, the, that, that, and the argument of, let's say, secularists is, is that, uh, no, you have to be a decision maker. You have to be. The, you have to be involved in, in making moral commitments. And so many laws. Can, can you give us an example? Torah, so we, just to make it so, more concrete. So Torah is saying yeah. you still have to be a decision maker. Right. The only thing is, is it's the it's method of making decisions has shifted. But there's another problem, which is this: you know, the Torah gives us a lot of raw material with which True. to work. True. Now the question is, can the amateur, can the novice, ah, right, exactly, is he uh, jumping into quicksand when he tries to make totally. decisions? Totally, totally, which, 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 which is something that's very strong because when I argue for this and I show that halachic, the halachic process is the process of decision making. And I remember we once spoke about this once, is that, is that you're going to know what your answer is going to be by choosing your rav, right? You choose that's the right. rabbi you're going to, then you have an idea of where, what the answer is going to, going to come to. And, and, and the point is, is that that's because halacha is decision making. And I always advocate knowing that halacha is decision making, and people say, yeah, but people will get involved. But then I say, but you should know that the only decision you can make is choosing your expert, right? right? But you don't have the ability to actually make the decisions. Well, right? you have the ability. If just, you learn, just if you learn. 30 years to study. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, 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 but the point but is... But you do have to, I mean, if you, if yes. you want to take the shortcut, if you don't want to go to medical school, you have to go to a doctor. Right, exactly. <laughs> but even in exactly. choosing the expert, I mean, when you have a medical problem, you, it, sometimes you are just randomly choosing between... I mean, it's hearsay, the guy out in Boston is an expert, he's really good, but the guy in New York, but, so which one am I doing? So, oh, it's almost kind of random, Where am, if I'm, am I going to Boston or New York? Is, it, is there something more thoughtful that goes on when you're choosing a rav, when you're choosing a, a decision maker? Or is it also just random? Well, I, I think, again, in the scientific community, oddly, there's a lot more consensus. In other words, except for the unusual uh, condition, there generally is a conventional wisdom as to how a certain disease is treated. Um, I think in, in halacha, there's a lot more range of opinions out there. But Ramosha actually says that. In one of his, in one of his responses, Moshe Feinstein was the, was the, the post Hekador, the decider of Jewish law until his passing in 86. But, but he actually makes a statement of that. He says that disagreement in the secular world, he, he basically said that must emerge from negative qualities because there's got to be one answer in the physical world. But in the world of Torah, and, and, and he, you know, if they see his, his exact explanations for this, but he says the world is full of disagreement, and that's the way it should be in that realm. That there's greater chances for, for acceptable and legitimate disagreement in the realm of Torah. And, can I, can and, I, I, and, and, and it's, he actually looks upon what you're, what you're describing as reality as a greatness of the Torah, of the, of the Torah system. So I don't know if Maimonides would agree with this. No, he would not. Because Maimonides no, no. says really that if people would develop their intellects fully, right. there probably would be a, a very narrow area in which there's dispute. Right. And really the explosion of dispute in the Talmud was a consequence of right. people not devoting themselves to their studies as right. they should. Right, and, but you see that tension in the Talmud of certain statements it's almost which one, validating. By the way, which one are you more inclined to? Because I'm just thinking because of a comment you made earlier gave me the impression that you thought that there was something uh, there, there's something intrinsically opposing, the, uh, the, something not, sorry, not intrinsic to God's commandment, something extrinsic to the commandment that is opposing the clarity. So is it a human failing or uh, who knows what? You know, it, it, it may be a human failing. I mean, I don't think Torah is like uh, Sudoku, in which there's only one answer right. to where you put the numbers in the boxes. Right. Um, but, but I do think that a lot of the people nowadays who are expressing opinions might not be qualified to do so. Right. In other words, um, to give a really valid opinion, especially in the area of Jewish law, requires a lot of uh, learning, a lot of expertise. If you don't have it, 
you might jump to conclusions which aren't necessarily valid. It's a, it's you know, we should take a, another short commercial break and we will be back in a few minutes. Welcome back. We are talking about the divine will and its clarity. Rabbi Heft, I, I, think I, you want, want to I just want to throw out one idea in, in presenting this, 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 this viewpoint. It's my belief that, that we, um, a Kodesh Baruch Hu has given us a contradictory task as human beings. One is to be an Ebed Hashem, which means to bend our wills to the will of heaven. A, ser a servant of God. A yeah. servant of God. And the other aspect is the concept of uh, trying to be at Salam Elohim, trying to work in the image of God. Now the word Elohim is a significant word because the word Elohim also has implications to judgment and the ability to, to judge. If God gives revelation in a very straightforward way and say, do this, do this, it would highlight the Ebed, the, the Ebed Hashem aspect of, of the service to God, but it would totally remove the ability of the individual mm. to actually bring forth his divine essence and so forth. So, I think that what has happened is exactly that, <laughs> is that in Revelation, what Akash Baruch Hu said is you, you show that you are an Ebed Hashem by being committed to make decisions through the process of halacha. And so so, so the, 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 our divine nature emerges out of the cloudiness of the revelation. In certain it, ways, in certain ways that, that, that God basically says, you show your commitment and your, your, your allegiance to him and your, and your service to him by saying, I will make decisions through this process. And I agree totally with Robert Breidowitz that people don't recognize that that does not mean reading uh, an article here, an article there. It means if you're going to, if, you know, in making decisions, you have to commit yourself to make, to make decisions or you have to take the decision to, to to choose a Rav, a Selecha Rav, which is one of the great sadnesses of our world today, that people no longer have Rebbeim, that you they're know, really in Can I ask with. this question? Are we all supposed to be rabbis? At least, let's speak of, of the Jews. Let's are we so? I don't think everyone has to be the supreme halacha authority. But I think you need a certain level of learning to be able to know what is a question worth asking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And I think <laughs> that really is uh, lamentable. That most Jews don't acquire that basic grounding, so they don't even know what is worth asking. Like the son at the Seder table who doesn't even know what the question is. Exactly. Right, right. But so I, so I, you think at, at least we have to all rise to that level, at least to know yeah. how to ask a question of a rabbi. I think it's clear from the mm -hmm. Torah itself. I mean, the Torah um, created a uh, categorical imperative of Torah study for all Jews. Um, I don't think it means that every Jew has to devote his life full time to scholarship. I don't think everyone has the capacity for that. But I think that there is a certain body of knowledge, defining it might be difficult, that every Jew should attempt to master. And uh, I, I think that would greatly make the debate, make the discussion a lot more intelligent. And I think that, you know, a lot of the temptation to uh, rely on you know, shortcuts and uh, you know, popular manuals for Jewish practice really is rooted in a fundamental laziness, if you will. You know, people don't want to exert the effort. They really want to have the answers handed to them on a silver platter. If the rabbi won't do it, then the bookseller will do it. And uh, you know, that is something which is, which is very, very sad because you, know, you can go through the motions, but if you don't really understand what you're doing, then how much meaning could it really have? Do you, do you agree with Rabbi Hecht, by the way? I get the sense that, that his claim is stronger, that our divinity, our, our Tzalem Elohim, depends on this, at least on getting the questions right? Well, I, I certainly think that, that the Torah was given in such a way to challenge us, to challenge us to use our minds, to work at it. Um, you know, Torah study is difficult. God certainly could have made it easier. <laughs> you know? Right. The, but it seems, it seems uh, you know, if, if you'll forgive me, uh, I'm sitting with two rabbis here, it, c it could be interpreted or construed as a little bit aristocratic. 
Because if, at least your claim, if our tzelem elokim, or the, the fact that we are made in the image of God, depends directly on how much Torah we understand, then what are we to do with the hierarchy? With the fact that there are some people that seem to embody more of the image of God than others do. But, or Moshe Feinstein. But I, but I think the hierarchy, again, is really, the Torah didn't create the hierarchy. I think to a certain extent, um, the abdication of responsibility created the hierarchy. I think, you see, I think that, that, that you're looking at it in terms of a democratic process and so forth. I, I'm not evaluating any individual. I'm not evaluating the soul of an individual or whatever. I, I, have, I think a person has to know where they are in the level of Torah, uh, Torah study and so forth. I think you have to recognize that wherever you are, even the original question of I have to make the decision of who I'm going to ask this question to. I have to make a decision of what shear I'm going to go to so forth. That in a certain way, God is bringing out the, the, the complexity of being a human being in the process of, of relating to God. And there's these two dialectics for every human being on any level. One is the fact that you have to be an Evan Hashem, and you have to be subservient, and the other one is the fact that God also wants you to use your brain, use your abilities, and come forth with the fullness of your being in His service as well. And where it's different for different people. But, but I think the, the process is there when you understand that Torah is complex and is difficult, that you understand that the relationship with Torah is not simple. It is, it is, it is an in-depth relationship. And to me, I, I, find, I find that I, I'm constantly telling people, say lecha rav, that your starting point is that the relationship with the, with the Rebbe, which will also create someone who can give you a little muster sometimes, someone who can, who can direct you, someone who you can go with questions. And, 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 yeah. Right. And, and, and I think that that's, that's terribly lacking in our world today, that, that um, a book can't talk back to you. Right. You know, a, 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 a uh, you know, I mean, um, we're looking at Chumash, it's obviously right. um, uh, an uh, important book, but uh, a safer, but the point is, is, is that a, a Rebbe can tell you you're off the wall with, with what you're saying, you know? Or it can say, very, very nice, but did you look at that Gemara over there? What do you mean? You, you don't even know it? So, what are you talking about? And, and that's... that's... never ends. The learning never ends. Thank you for joining us on Passages. For your Kabbalistic Jolt of the Week, stay tuned for Messages, up next. <laughs>